Hi, everyone. This is a video for uh, CCNY Music Theory Fundamentals. And we're, this is part two of our review of chapter eight on intervals. In the first part, we talked a lot about um, the two basic components of any interval, which is, as I've said, pro at least a dozen times now, size and quality. So size always correlates with some number, be it a unison, a second, a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or uh, octave. And that number is, you find that number based on letter names. Um, so you can count on uh, spaces and lines of letter names, how many there are in between, or just count up or down from, from those letters, right? So there's size and then there's quality, and we looked at major and minor mostly and, uh, and units, I mean, and perfect intervals. Your book goes through two different ways of uh, figuring out intervals. And I look at those, right? One is the scale and key signature method. One is the C major or white key method. Do whichever one works for you. And, but you should know both of them and use them um, in whatever way you can use them both and to double check one another and just find out which one is fastest for you. But I want you to direct you to this chart here on page 207. This is a very, very useful thing to come back to because it shows you the half steps. Uh, if all else fails, you can always just count the number of half steps between two pitches and then figure out both its distance and uh, its size and quality, right? Now, I want to remind you though that the number of half steps don't tell you automatically what interval it is. You then have to decide based on um, the size, but the number of half steps will give you a lot of information that you need. So for example, uh, let's, let me go to my piano here. So this chart on 207, uh, very useful. Let's clear this. Let's say we have an A, or that I won't even call it an A. I'll just call it this key and this key, right? Now, we know that this is an, or we, we shouldn't say we know, but we would imagine that most of the time this is going to be an A and a C. Right. Okay. Now, if I ask you to identify the interval between A and C, first let's figure out the size um, A, B, C. If we were looking at notation, which I won't pull up right now, but you can imagine you would count. Um, a, a line in a space or the line, the two spaces in a line, but A, B, C. So it's some type of third. How many half steps is it? One, so from A, one, two, three, right? So what third has three half steps? It's a minor third. Let's look right here. Minor third is a type of third, right? That has three half steps. So three half steps, if it's got three half steps and it's a third, then it's a minor third. Now we can complicate things. Let's clear this. Let's take this same, the same two pitches here, this key and this key, A, but instead of C, what if I wanna call it a B sharp? Right. Remember our inharmonic spelling and there's any number of reasons we might call it a B sharp. There's not any number. There's, you know, really a couple reasons this might be called a B sharp. We don't have the musical context to even decide why that would be at this moment. But let me just call this a B sharp. What kind of what what is our size? Never mind our quality of the interval, but what number does it get? A, B. 
So it has to be some kind of second. It can't be a third because a third above A has to be some type of C, not a B. So A to B sharp is still the same number of half steps, right? One, two, three. Three half steps, but it's a second. Now this chart doesn't give us that interval, right? This chart has three half steps correlating with a minor third. Let's look at seconds here. So we have a minor second that's one half step. We have a major second that's two half steps. And I just showed you a second, A to B sharp, some type of second that is three half steps. Do you know what that's called? It's an augmented second. An augmented second is three half steps. Uh, so that tells you a couple of different things that I want you to keep in mind. First, that just because some interval, just because there's three half steps between two notes does not mean it's a minor third. It often will be. It usually will be, but it won't always be a minor third, all right? So don't take this chart as gospel uh, because as you just saw, there is an example of a distance of three half steps, one, two, three, that is not called a minor third. If I call this note a B sharp, then that is an augmented second interval. The quality is augmented and it's a second because it's an A to a B. So that's the first thing. While this chart is very useful uh, and you should bookmark it or come back to it, memorize it. I have many students that just decide to memorize this chart and it doesn't take very long and it's pretty easy. Uh, and then you can, then you always know how many half steps and you can use that to double check. So while it is useful, it isn't gospel. And then we also just learned about an augmented interval, okay? that it's even, it's a major interval that's expanded. So what I mean by that, let's take this interval, A to B. What's its size? One, two, it's some sort of second. Any A to any B is some sort of second. How many half steps? One, two. So a second with two half steps is what kind of second? What's its quality? Major. Check it out, major second, two half steps. But then what if I say, all right, I'm gonna expand this B, I'm gonna add a sharp, an accidental to it, B sharp. Now we've got a second, still a second, because it's an A, some sort of A to some sort of B, one, two, three half steps. So a major second that then is expanded by a half step to three half steps, instead of two is an augmented second. So there you go. Um, let me just make sure that's all I wanted to say about that in particular. Yeah, I think that's the right ideas. So a good chart to keep in mind. Again, read through your book, do the exercises to decide kind of which works for you. Uh, this leads us into our augmented um oh you know what i'm i'm sorry here uh let me back up just a second or no never mind i'm gonna let's do augmented and diminished and then i'll talk about inverting intervals just for a second um because that can be useful so we just said what augmented and diminished intervals are uh the best way to think about it, this key concept on 208, when a major or perfect interval is made a chromatic half step larger, okay? Remember that chromatic half step means that the letter is, stays the same. When the letter changes, it's a diatonic half step. So when a major or perfect interval is made a chromatic half step larger, call it augmented. When a minor or perfect interval is made a chromatic half step smaller, call it diminished, okay? Uh, let me actually 
think it might be useful to show you. Okay, th this is good here. So augmented intervals here. Here's a perfect fourth. Look at example 823. D to G. I'll even show you here. Let's clear this. So that's a perfect fourth. D to G. Double check. D, E, F, G. It's a fourth. Okay. If you look back at your, well, go look back at your chart. Um, but it's a, a perfect fourth is a five half steps. A fourth that is five half steps is a perfect fourth. Okay. So that's our perfect fourth. Now, D to G is modified, it becomes D to G sharp, not A flat, right? Because then that becomes something else and I'll explain. So instead of D to G, we're gonna go D to G sharp. So a perfect fourth raise, again, remember this, it's a good key concept. This is a perfect interval that is made a chromatic half step larger, right? The perfect interval was D to G and it's made a chromatic half step larger, D to G sharp, so that becomes augmented. Let's look at the reverse here, uh, B flat to E flat. B flat down to E flat, right? Let's hear it first. That's a perfect fifth, right? B, A, G, F, E. I'm not even saying flat or, or flats or sharps or anything, just counting so we get our size to double check that it's a fifth, right? Some sort of B, A, G, F, E. So that's some sort of fifth. Our quality is perfect because a perfect fifth is made up of seven half steps. B flat, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all right? So B flat down to E flat is a perfect fifth as it shows you here. Now, what's changed? The B flat hasn't changed, the E is made E natural. So we've uh, narrowed our interval, we've made it smaller. This E flat, what happens when you add a natural sign to a flat, it goes up here, right? So this E flat is now E natural, but it stays some sort of E, so it's still some sort of fifth, right? It's still B, A, G, F, E, some sort of E. But now instead of seven half steps, we have six, double check. So B flat, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we've taken a perfect fifth and made it smaller by a chromatic half step from E flat to E natural. So this interval is what we call a diminished fifth. So, and, and just to back up, let's look at our chart one more time. So perfect fifth. Sorry, I got something in the way here. Uh, perfect fifths are seven half steps. And then uh, diminished fifths, which we just saw are six, it shows you there. Also, we saw our first example, a perfect fourth, remember D to G, five half steps, and a augmented fourth is six half steps. So isn't it interesting how it's the same number of half steps, both an augmented fourth and a diminished fifth. It's the same exact sound, but they get different names based on nothing other than the uh, the way they're spelled on the page. And they have different functions that it may seem really arbitrary to you at this early stage, but you'll find later on 
that the difference matters to some extent, especially when you're performing it. Okay, uh, let's go back here. So that's diminished and augmented intervals. Go through all these exercises, they're really useful. Oh, oh and it's not just perfect intervals, remember? Um, in that example we were just looking at, here we see a minor third that becomes a diminished third, a major six that becomes an augmented six. Uh, so this chart is good too, actually, um, right here. Shows the interval size produced when you make an interval chromatic half step smaller or larger. In fact, I wanna give this a little highlight for myself, right? So diminished, minor, major. Diminished, perfect, augmented, and so forth. Very useful. Okay, uh, let me back up a bit to inverted intervals. Here we are. So, uh, where did this go? Okay, here we go. Inverting intervals is really a, a useful tool. Being able to recognize inverted intervals and being able to do this kind of um, process in your head or on your, with your hands is useful. It will just save you a lot of time, to be honest. So take a look at um, this example here. An inverted interval, remember that notes repeat, the same pitch at a, is an octave higher. So this C, right, this C right here is an octave lower than this C, but they're both Cs. They both get the same pitch name. They're just in different registers, um, but they're very closely related. Um, so th this C right here, middle C to this G is a perfect fifth, right? Oh, whoops, I wanted to play. Right? C, E, uh, sorry, C, D, E, F, G. That's a five. A perfect fifth happens to be seven half steps. And we'll just um, double check here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven half steps. So that's a perfect fifth. Now, this G to this C is not a perfect fifth, which is to say any C G relationship isn't identical, right? Because C up to G is a perfect fifth, but G up to C is not. It happens to be a perfect fourth. It obviously can't be a fifth because G a, B, C, that's a four, right? This is some sort of four. And then we'll, if we look at the half steps, any four, perfect four should be five half steps. So from G, one, two, three, four, five. So there's a relationship here and that relationship is one of inversion. These are inversionally uh, related. Okay, so intervals related by inversion share the same notes, but with either the lower pitch raised by an octave or the upper pitch lowered by an octave. Intervals related by inversion are the unison and octave, second and seventh, third and sixth, fourth and fifth. In each case, the sum of the two intervals is nine. And it goes through what, if that sounds confusing, it's really, uh, fairly simple once you do a few of these, right? But it's all to say that for you to do the math real quick, uh, let's just do a couple examples again on the, on the keyboard, why not? So we just did fourths and fifths, right? A perfect fourth and perfect fifth. Let's take a third and sixth. Let's do thirds and sixth. Um, let's stay with C. C to E is what kind of interval? Let's first do size. One, two, three, C, D, E, some sort of third. What about quality? Uh, one, two, three, four half steps. 
What third has four half steps? A major third. So C to E is a major third, right? What about E to C? That is obviously much larger than a third. You can see, just imagine playing it on the keyboard. Your hand has to stretch much more to go from E up to C than from C up to E, okay? So what kind of interval is this? Well, you can count it out. First, C, uh, C oh, sorry, E, F, G, A, B, C, some sort of sixth. Uh, if you count the intervals, you will get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight half steps. Now, eight half steps that's a sixth is called a minor sixth, right? So the inversion relationship here is one between a major third and a minor sixth. Now, the, the way this becomes a useful shortcut is that you can eventually just remember these relationships and also notice three and six is nine, that the relationship, um, instead of, you'll get to the point where you don't have to count eight half steps, you'll just know, well, if E, let's say I just gave you this, E to C. If you know that C to E is a major third, then at, because of the inversion, if I, if I were to invert this, then it'd be a major third, then you'll know the relationship between um, thirds and sixths. Because you know that relationship, you'll know that this is a minor sixth. Sounds kind of wonky. Uh, it's really not, and it will save you some time eventually. So at least understand these relationships. Oh, here's that the example we just did with different pitches. F to A is a major third, A to F then is a minor sixth. This summary is super useful um, on how to invert intervals in the process when you're doing it. Okay. So that's inversions, really fun examples uh, and exercises here. I think they're fun. Uh, you might not, but they're definitely useful and helpful. So do them. Okay. Uh, lastly, just a word about compound intervals. Let's spend just a minute on that. Uh, Intervals larger than an octave are compound intervals. Simple intervals are an octave or smaller. So all that you're really doing when you're thinking about compound intervals, obviously, or maybe it isn't obvious, but it, you'll, the music that you're listening to, not every note that you hear is within one octave, right? La, yeah. <laughs> that horrible sounding screech was much higher than one octave away. And it was terrifying. But uh, so compound intervals are when you expand beyond an octave. And it's really simple to remember that once you get past eight, if eight is an octave, then you can just subtract by seven um, to get the kind of interval that it's going to be. So right here, a uh, D to E is a ninth, right? But it's it's kind of like a second, right? Um, but it's just an octave higher. And think about the keyboard here. This D to this E is a major second, is a second. Let's just call it a second and worry about quality later. Uh, this is a second. Now let's say I just take this E and move it up an octave. It's still D to E, but it's just an octave higher. So we, instead of calling it a second, we call it a ninth because it's a second plus an octave. That's a nice way to think about it, actually. Um, or a second up an octave, okay? So a third, if, if this is a ninth, what would this be? Well, think about it like this. D to F down here is what kind of interval? It's some kind of third, it's a minor third. And so up 
if we do this, then it's a tenth. This is an eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, etc. And you get your handy conversion chart. So yeah, that's at least wanted to get a brief discussion of that. Uh, it may seem a little scary seeing these large numbers, but there, there's really not that much going on here uh, beyond what you typically would find with simple intervals. All righty, I believe that's really it. Uh, there's a, oh, actually, I'll just say one thing about this next part, consonants and dissonance. You should read this, you should understand how consonants and dissonance more or less works. There's a summary down here on what intervals are consonant and what are dissonant. Um, I don't, however, want you to take that as some sort of taxonomy as, and as gospel. Because the problem here is that your book is really adhering to a kind of classical music mindset and ear of what consonance and dissonance is. And that's just not the world we live in. Uh, even, never mind pop music, which completely blows up, or I shouldn't say completely, but has problematizes this taxonomy of what is consonant and what are consonant intervals, what are dissonant intervals, but also jazz music does it, even plenty of classical music can be argued, or especially classical music into the late 19th century and 20th century. Uh, so it's useful to understand how these consonant and dissonant intervals came to be codified as consonant or dissonant, but don't take them as universal. Uh, and if you, if you for some reason hear certain intervals as being kind of is having some sort of stasis that don't need to that aren't dissonant that's understandable and it's very much part of how we listen to music that doesn't adhere to this textbook definition so i just wanted to throw that out there okay and uh i guess that's it for chapter eight let me know if you have any questions as always and i will speak to you soon Take care.